arsenical candy and copper peas, food adulteration in 19th century Michigan, in partnership with the culinary historians of Ann Arbor. When we think about 19th century Michigan, sometimes people have a somewhat idealized feeling or thought about it. This is the type of scene we associate with that time. This is a real photograph of a farm just southwest of downtown Ypsilanti, the Crittenden Farm. You can see the Crittenden family with their showcased crop of peaches. Maud, Margaret, Dwayne, Mort, old Tom and old Kit, and a hired man whom I could not identify from census records, so that's a big mystery. This is a picture. You can see that's actually not from the 19th century. You can tell by the date on the silo, but I included it because the silo itself is a 19th century silo, a wood stave silo. Different types of silos can be used to date farms. This is one of the older, less expensive silos that was used. Silos only came into use in Michigan around the 1880s, so that helps date this picture. So on that basis, I included this picture. And other firms in Washtenaw County, like this one, is from the famous Washtenaw County Platt book, also present what we think of as an idealized view. Pictures like this, which the owner of the farm paid for to be included in the Platt book as a means of showing off their beautiful farm. This one is from a William Wessels, who farmed all the way over on the western, extreme western side of Washtenaw County. He had a mixed farm. He farmed grain and livestock, like almost every 19th century farm in Washtenaw County. Very different from today's kind of um, one, at one crop agriculture system. And this picture exemplifies some of the values we still consciously or unconsciously associate with farms, like this tidy, neat, painted barn, which also shows how thriftily the farmer is storing all of his goods. You can see he's bringing in a load of hay, which kind of reminds us of you know, an honest day's work, purposeful work, measurable work, work that has a, a, a measurable result in the real world. It was a, a slow-paced life that we, as we think of it today, only about as fast as a horse as a horse or actually um, as a train, because this is 1874, so we would already have had trains in the worlds of these people. You can see there's a very nice brick house in front of an expansive spread of nature. And a little um, windmill can exemplify self-reliance. We get our own water. We rely on our own um, sources for services uh, for um, um, utilities now covered by municipal services. So everything in this picture are some of the things we think about when we think about 19th century farms. And that association is so strong, it tends to carry over into modern day food packaging. These are three small examples. And you can see the same types of structures. This is probably a concrete silo, but the same types of structures recurring in even 2019 food packaging. There's a few more examples. Here's the Purdue household. Shows a kind of idealized farm in a glowing sunrise. It's almost like a Thomas Kincaid painting of sorts. And Pepperidge Farm offers farmhouse cookies with dark chocolate. I'm not sure exactly where you might get dark chocolate on a 19th century Washtenaw <laughs> farm, but We'll let that pass. But the most interesting example to me, or the most attenuated example of how far to push this association, is Stouffer's Farmer's Harvest macaroni and cheese. <laughs> so it's, I kind of was wondering, you know, the, trying to trace the connection between a farm and a, a bowl of macaroni and cheese. And that reminded me of a very famous BBC documentary from 1957 <laughs> called The Spaghetti Tree Documentary. It was done in a very deadpan BBC type manner. And it showed the wonderful spaghetti crop being harvested from trees, 
put into this lovely basket for collection and storage. And it was so convincing that the BBC was overwhelmed with calls after the program of people asking, where can I get a spaghetti tree? I really want to put a spaghetti tree in my backyard, just like those you know, you know, Swiss spaghetti farmers. So it kind of reminded me of that. But tangent aside, here are the topics we'll be discussing today. Although we associate all those pure and idealized values with 19th century farms, actually adulteration was rampant in that period. We'll take a look at some ancient precedents. It was not a unique thing to America or Michigan or the 19th century. We'll take a look at some early Michigan examples and attempts to combat adulteration. What are the factors that contributed to this phenomena? They are many. We'll take a look at some example foods and how they were tainted with a focus on milk and a very famous scandal in Detroit. And we'll take a look at one particular ill-fated condiment company in Ypsilanti. And last, a quick roundup of food reform that addressed the problem. In the ancient world, adulteration was not a foreign concept. When I looked around, I found examples from around the globe, from an ancient botanical book by Theophrastus, Chinese example, there were people overseeing the markets to make sure there were no tainted foods, even before the common era. There was a Roman law against fraud, including food production. Ancient Egypts had very detailed provenance on the side of their wine jars. I've seen some examples of it. They're very, they tell precisely where this wine came from, so you could be sure of, no, of uh, pure product. Even Sanskrit texts from the ancient world prohibited adulteration of a number of foodstuffs, all of which suggest that this has been a common problem since in all of human history. And um, Pliny the Elder, in his famous 39 volume or 37 or 39 volume natural history, which you can see here, very charmingly depicted with little pictures of animals, talked about adulteration as well. Juniper berries sold as pepper, wine was tainted, and he complained about additives in bread, how there was chalk and terra alba added to bread. So this is an old, old problem. It was a common one in Britain as early as the days of William the Conqueror. You are familiar with the Domesday Book, which was a survey of all the lands and property in the kingdom to find out what belonged to the king, what belonged to the bishop, who owned what. Also included in the Domesday Book were laws of various small English cities at that time, one, one of which being Chester, which is just south of Liverpool. Chester, even that early, had a law against adulteration of beer. And if you were found to have tainted your beer, you could be subject to the dung chair, also known as the ducking or cucking chair. So. Um, a well-known event even that early that continued after through successive monarchies with various rules and laws against the size and weight of bread, the purity of ale. And this was interesting. This is something my husband pointed out, which I thought was a shrewd observation. There were very detailed three-level punishments for um, cheating at bread baking. So after the first offense, a baker would be um, drawn on a hurdle, this is a hurdle, this structure, with the bread tied around their neck as a form of shaming. But there was also a second and a third offense for the same thing. So this was, this was, a pro this was definitely a common problem. There were also many laws surrounding the, the manufacture and sale of tea which none of which, of course, was native to uh, Britain, all of which had to be shipped in from China and later from India. The Dutch East India Company introduced tea to Europe um, around 1610, and then from Netherlands it came over to Britain and um, was popularized by the monarch of that day and became hugely popular. But it was also hugely adulterated with um, the green tea was, co was colored with chemicals uh, or um, dyes, 
And black tea was often um, tainted with substitutions or tan bark or other um, leaves from other plants. So it was also widely adulterated. Until this gentleman, Frederick Ackham, or Ackham, was a German chemist working in Britain who was the first person to publish a comprehensive look at adulterated foods. He published this volume, which caused an immense sensation in its day. It was very controversial in it because in this volume, of which listed the adulterated foods in Britain, he named names and was very specific about the businesses that provided these impure foods. As a result, he made a lot of enemies in Britain and eventually had to leave the country, although um, he left the country because he was caught ripping pages out of, a, out of uh, some books in, in a library. It was an, an unrelated reason. But he was, he was, but he was, he was, I'm sure, happy to go because he uh, got in, uh, stirred up a lot of ill will against him because of the manner in which he directly addressed the transgressors who were providing tainted food. He went back to Berlin and um, actually in a strange, cruel twist of fate, the manner in which he died in, at age 69 was from a food-related ailment, which is gout. After, after um, doing everything to, to be a reformer of food, he actually succumbed from doubt called the rich person's disease, incurred from eating a lot of rich foods, drinking a lot of beer, eating things like shrimp or butter or other rich foods. So it's so kind of a, a sad ending to someone who really started um, this whole awareness of how widespread food adulteration was. Now let's go from Britain over to early Michigan. Adulteration was a familiar idea even before Michigan became a state in 1837. In 1835, when we were still a territory, this was so familiar an idea that it was used in this article as a kind of a meme. They talk about the adulteration of wine, but here is the interesting part to me. They use it to compare it to, and to, to the current politics as a way of criticizing the Whigs. I thought this was interesting because it's a sort of a meme that they are riffing off of or building from assuming that this idea of adulteration is so familiar that they can use it as to make a simile with current politics. So that was the degree to which this was already a familiar idea to people even before we ever became a state, which we did in 1837. And the first body of laws drafted by Michigan had four main parts. They dealt with how do we govern the state? What are property rights? How do we run courts and judges and crime and punishment, which is where we find references to adulteration. In the crime and punishment section of the body of laws are offenses against the public health, selling unwholesome provisions, which would be things that are old or rotten or rancid. And they specifically spell out adulterated food or liquors and drugs or medicine, which is another great topic that I hope um, we have a chance to talk about sometime. The law specifically says if anyone's found fraudulently adult, uh, shall, shall fraudulently adulterate any food, wine, spirits, malt liquor, or other liquor intended for drinking with any substance injurious to health, he shall be punished by imprisonment of not more than one year or of a fine not exceeding $6,700 in today's money, and the article shall be forfeited and destroyed. That's a well-meaning law, which had almost zero enforcement behind it. So adulteration continued pretty unimpeded in Michigan and elsewhere. And you see laws continuing throughout the early history of Michigan against adulteration like this one, against the adulteration of liquor. Apparently the former law Again, this, this 37, 1837 law was 
but they felt they had to revise it or strengthen it, and that continued throughout the history of Michigan. You see a string of, of laws about adulteration. Now, this was so widespread. Why was it so widespread? What were all the contributing factors that led to this rampant problem, these long lists of laws? The, let's see. One of them is simple urbanization. The 19th century saw an incredible rise in urbanization in the United States. You can see 1800 to 1900. The yellow line is the United States, and it shows a, a very strong and steady rise from about maybe 9% of the population living in a city up to, at the end of 1900, perhaps some half of the population living in a city. That's a, that's a titanic change in, um, the, in lifestyle, in habits, and urbanization led to, offered a, a climate that encouraged adulteration. There's no longer <coughs> autonomous food production. You aren't making your own food or harvesting it. You don't have a truck garden or kitchen garden in a tenement house. Also, there's a lot of middlemen between the food that you're buying in a city and the farms from which it came. Or maybe it came in on a train. Maybe it came in on a ship. All those middlemen probably took a cut or had opportunity to um, meddle with food. In a city, there are many competitive sellers. There is um, a drive to try to offer a cheaper product. So that can encourage adulteration. And in a city, you have proximity to things like chemicals, factories, um, things that um, facilitate easy adulteration of foods. Another really interesting reason, I read about this for a long time, it was so interesting, is that the coal chain had not yet become perfected in America. If you think about it, the coal chain is really integral to food security. It started with ice pits that were brought over from, that were um, duplicated from English ice pits. They were built in this country, too. There was one at the first White House that we had in Philadelphia, when our capital was at Philadelphia. The president's house, which housed George Washington and John Adams, had a large octagonal ice pit right outside beside it. It was lined with brick. It was used to keep ice cool in the summer. And based on those kinds of ideas, in 1802, cabinet maker Thomas More invented what we would kind of think of as a cooler. He took a wooden oval basket and in it built a tin box. He put ice between the tin box and the basket and put rabbit fur on top. And this was a new invention that he used to take his butter to market. And he had um, a competitive advantage once he got to market because his butter was solid and fresh in his homemade cooler. And it was um, a more attractive product than the butter offered by his competitors at the market, which would be melted or not as fresh. Thomas Jefferson was so impressed by this cooler that he bought one and had it at, Mon at, Mont I think at Monticello. He also drew a picture of it in some of his papers. You can see it's a very simple device, but a revolutionary one, which eventually the coal technology went, led to refrigerated rail cars, which started to be used after the Civil War, it really came into their own with the rise of meat packing plants. And people like Gustav Swift, in, who used these refrigerated cars to transport meat all over the country, People soon realized that we can use this, these refrigerated rail cars to transport vegetables and fruit as well. There's some discussion that the rise of the refrigerated rail car is what led to localities specializing in, in single crops. There's some thought that because the rail cars were so useful in eliminating the distance between farm and market that people could grow um, people in a certain location could grow a single crop instead of the, the multiple crops they used to grow. Rural areas, unfortunately, were not serviced by rail cars, refrigerated rail cars. There were still a lot of holes in the cold chain system, even if, as it was continuing to develop in America. 
In one survey in 1907, they found 81% of New York inhabitants had ice boxes, a very popular item. My guess is that the remaining 19% did not have ice boxes, not because they didn't want one, but probably because they could not afford one. It was still a fairly elaborate piece of furniture. When home refrigerators were introduced around 1915 and thereafter, there was a very fast adoption of them. This was a, something people really wanted. And frozen foods were then invented in 1924. So for most of the 19th century, a very patchy, in, you know, imperfect, incomplete cold chain was another factor helping adulteration. Once I read about Thomas Jefferson's cooler, I had to learn more about it. I came across this letter that his granddaughter wrote, and she criticized this cooler as filthy, which she kind of scratched out right there. Grandpapa, President Jefferson, insisted on using that filthy cooler, refrigerator, I believe he calls it, which wasted our small stock of ice and gave us butter that run about the plates, we could scarcely catch it, and wine above blood heat. But on Burwell's recovery, I assume that's someone who came back to their house, he soon scouted it, to use Aunt M's favorite, and we have been quite comfortable ever since. So she a little less than impressed with this new technology, which soon became pretty sophisticated. This is a refrigerator, refrigerator made in Michigan at the Grand Rapids Refrigerator Company. This is a trade card that was printed to popularize this product. And I thought it was, I thought it was not only a beautiful piece of work, but rather charming. Cupid says, this is too hot for me. I'm going to go cool off, which is a somewhat, maybe a little tortured <laughs> connection, but, and then you see this very elaborate, beautiful piece of furniture. This cherub is showing where the ice would go in this com compartment right here under the lid. It looks like they put a mirror on it too. You can see the foods, there's a chicken and maybe some potatoes and other good things in the refrigerator. So. That's from around 1890 or so, made in Michigan. What are the factors, the other factors, affecting adulteration aside from urbanization and the growth of the, coal, the growth of the cold chain? People wanted to enhance their product to make it competitive. There was an issue of preservation in line with the other issues we've talked about. More people moving to cities. There's a more and more distance between the production and the consumption of food. And of course, just to make a profit by substituting ingredients, by swapping out this expensive thing for maybe a little cheaper thing or something that looked the same. And of course, there was no regulatory agency that would punish anyone at this time. There were no food recalls. There were no labeling rules. So you had very wide um, scope to produce um, any kind of food that you might wish to sell. And some examples are butter. Butter was very widely adulterated. Butter was something that in a city like Ann Arbor or Ypsilanti, you would buy downtown, but which came from surrounding farms. Farmers brought butter and milk into town to trade for store-bought provisions. So butter is coming from a lot of different points around towns. Some farms were probably very sanitary and clean, some perhaps less so. So butter was uh, often adulterated by the removal of fat, the addition of water. You have to work butter when you prepare it, so it's easy enough to add a little bit of water, or um, color it to make it look nice and fresh and creamy with annatto, or maybe add boric acid as a preservative because it's so perishable, especially if you live 10 miles out of town. Renovated butter was an interesting item that I came across, which is taking rancid or sour butter, melting it down, aerating it again, mixing it with chemicals, straining it, adding a little skim milk, and then chilling it and then repackaging it as fresh creamery butter. It sounded absolutely disgusting when I was reading about it. 
but it was outlawed in Michigan, but it was still present. And you can see in the free press, they're talking about a tax on renovated butter of interest to Michigan dairymen and commission, and, uh, commission men, milk sellers. Renovated butter consists of all sorts of made over butter, mixing with natural milk or cream, animal fat, vegetable oils, or any oleaginous substance not produced from milk. Another widely adulterated food is coffee. Coffee is, has a lot of things that resemble it. There are a lot of things that look like brown powder. It's easy to adulterate. With chicory, people use dried or roasted peas or corn or other grains. They would often just add flour or caramel. They even went so far as to make bogus beans, so-called, with any kind of uh, flour or water mixture in machines similar to 19th century candy machines, which are molds that are compressed together. So they would even make fake beans to mix in with real beans and extend the supply. There's another mention of that machine in this free press story. The device that Pennsylvania has selected to deceive the world is a bogus coffee bean, taking advantage of the immense demand for the cup that cheers and also keeps people awake the Pennsylvania miscreant has artfully mingled the inexpensive flour with water and some yet unknown ingredients, and in a mold, cut, colored it and put it on the market in a form and aspect calculated to deceive the very elect, even upon the grocery and coffee experts. So coffee was adulterated from bean to ground form. Tea was another item that was often often had substitutions of just from a range of different plants. Tan bark, which is the bark used in tanneries to color leather, sounds delicious, or chemicals, different dyes, or even used tea leaves, which were sometimes also renovated and presented as fresh tea leaves. Cocoa is another expensive imported food that was prone to adulteration with arrowroot, sago flour, different colors, or ground cocoa shells. Honey was often um, tainted with any other sugary um, syrup, buckwheat flour, and baking powders. Pe some people in this room are probably familiar with the baking powder wars of the 19th century in which several companies were competing to try and offer a pure product, but it was often adulterated. And we're running through a few more examples here. Spices, of course, were also expensive and largely imported. They were subject to adulteration. A lot of mustard was, by and large, turmeric. People substituted what was a tonka bean for real vanilla beans, which, as you know, have to be hand-pollinated. Pepper was commonly adulterated. Cinnamon and any kind of thing like sago flour, potato flour, wheat flour, any other flour or cotton seed hulls were passed off as valuable spices. Even horseradish was adulterated, which I thought was odd. Vin vinegar was a widely adulterated substance as well. Vinegar, as you know, takes some time to really develop and produce. But a quick and easy way is just to adulterate it with a variety of acids, or lead, or copper, or even sulfuric acid diluted. Lard is another valuable fat you could mix it with oil or beef stearine, mineral oil. Jams and jellies had a lot of preservative um, added to them, including arsenic. Baby food was subject to adulteration because it's chopped up. It's very difficult to detect things in baby food. I thought that was really kind of sinister and scary. Maple syrup was another very time-consuming, labor-consuming product to harvest and boil down, you know. It was often um, tainted with glucose, corn syrup, colors, different colors, caramel colors, and also uh, lead from the containers used to harvest maple sap. Different condiments were widely adulterated, and meat was subject to a lot of preservatives, colorants, and formaldehyde. Sounds delightful. Candies were also widely adulterated to make them very bright or colorful, they used aniline or coal tar dyes, arsenic for that gorgeous green color, 
or paraffins to make a shiny, pleasant coating on candies. And we're going to take a look at um, a cartoon depicting the meat industry of the day. In Puck magazine, a satirical magazine, it says, watch the professor who's holding a cylinder labeled Packing Town, where um, meat was packed in Chicago. It's hard to read, but up here it says diseased livestock. And these poor little cows are getting shoved into the Packing Town cylinder from which are, are, is flowing a cornucopia, a bounty of pure meat products, beautiful pure meat products. There were a lot of cartoons of this ilk around this time. 1906, as you know, is when the federal pure law, um, pure laws, pure food laws were enacted. But let's take a look at candy. Arsenic in candy was a big problem. As you can see from these few examples culled from the free press, one of which says, in 1879, a boy died because he indulged too freely in highly colored candies, colored with arsenic. Same thing in this story, a three-year-old and a five-year-old succumbing to arsenic poisoning from something so innocent. This one, down at the side, I thought was sad. 1882, a nine-year-old boy has died from candies he got at a church fair. It's such a happy and innocent occasion. On 1882, the children ate colored candies. Some think they were poisoned. So this was a very widespread and, and sometimes very sad um, event. Milk is one food we're going to take a quick closer look at because of a famous scandal in Detroit history. What you're seeing is an ad that was taken out from a milk producer, George Tower, who says in this ad, I have never put formaldehyde in my milk, and I am so upset that the state inspector in this time, 1900, said that my milk contained formaldehyde. That is ridiculous. The inspector is a charlatan, and I have never put formaldehyde in my, in my milk. It's kind of protesting too much. This was an ad in the free press. Milk was one of the most widely adulterated substances, of course, because it's easy to adulterate simply with water. People also um, removed some of the fat from milk, producing what we would now call skim milk. In this time, skim milk was kind of a dirty word. People said, oh, it's just skim milk. You know, it's not real milk, although we just buy skim milk today. Back then, it was not the desired product. Here's a look at one of Tower's milk delivery vehicles that would be going around Detroit. As a, as a small aside, I thought this was interesting. You can see the reins are going through this little soffit area of the wagon so that you can operate the horse from inside the wagon. I thought that was a neat little detail. But this is the kind of um, contemporary vehicle that would be delivering George Tower's milk all around Detroit. He, George Tower, offered a, published another ad offering a $500 reward to anyone who could prove that there was formaldehyde in his milk. This was a huge scandal. It played out in the papers. He said, the state food inspector has appeared like a harlequin in the city, you know, trying to demonize the people trying to clean up the food supply in Detroit. And this case went to trial. One of the um, manners in which formaldehyde was actually indeed added to milk was through preservatives, like this one, called preservaline. It was formaldehyde sold as a food preservative used to uh, preserve milk. As you can see, this is an ad from a Michigan paper. And also, meats. Preservaline was a company that had a lot of, had quite a product range. It had preservaline A, preservaline B, preservaline C, which were different forms of this um, formaldehyde product. They also made some uh, other preserving salts but formaldehyde for preserving milk was one of their products. And that was commonly used to preserve milk. So this um, case with George Tower in Detroit went to trial. And you can, you can see, actually, preservaline. I love, that, I love that engraved logo. 
Preservaline was something that really um, made people sick. This ad is uh, from 1902. Uh, was is uh, making is an ad describing how people in Lansing were sickened by f uh, formaldehyde. You may recall that this ad from the Owasso Times. Owasso is just outside of Lansing, and that this Owasso ad is from 1898, and the Detroit Free Press ad about the Lansing people getting sick from it is only a couple of years later. So I'm wondering how widespread the Michigan use of preservaline was. The George Tower case went to trial. He was put on trial for um, using formaldehyde in work. A, a state chemist came in and the state chemist said, look at my proofs. I've tested this milk. It's full of formaldehyde. I, here, here's my experiment. Here's my experiment. Here's what I, um, here's what I produced from testing this milk. And Faced with that evidence, George Tower took a little different tack. He brought in a, um, an expert, a Professor Bacon, who said, actually, formaldehyde is, a, is not bad. It's not all that bad. Formaldehyde is something I use, said Professor Bacon, in my practice. I've used it with children. And it's, a, it's, it's OK. It's perfectly fine. It's not all that harmful. Kind of an odd defense. The case went to a jury. And they came back with a verdict. Verdict was for George Tower, who was not guilty. And he was not found, he was, he was not, the, the company won that lawsuit. So although he won, this was um, good publicity for the whole issue of adulteration. And people were aware of the problem. Even though he won, it did not really ease people's fears at all. They were well aware that many foods were being adulterated. And you can see that reflected in this kind of sardonic little remark here. It says in this Port Huron paper, Detroit milk dealers have been putting formaldehyde in the milk. Well, just, just give us the regular old water that you used to put in milk all the time. So we'll, we prefer that to formaldehyde. Let's take a look at one com company in particular, the ill-fated Ypsilanti Condiment Company, which operated right at the end of the 19th century. It had a lot of great products, as you can see, chow chow, a kind of pickle, other mixed pickles, mixed vegetable pickles, sweet pickles, gherkins, onions, Chili sauce, table sauce, all of the types of relishes that were popular in the late 19th, in the 19th century. Piccalilli, another type of pickle, and catsup. They did it all from their tiny little factory in Depot Town. This is a Sanford map of Depot, Depot Town. And you can see the condiment company is right here. This is Cross Street. This is the freight house in Ypsilanti. There's the old um, depot shown there. This is Depot Town's buildings, which are still extant. And behind them all, near the river, is the Ypsilanti Condiment Company, a tiny little company kind of stuck behind the facade of Depot Town. There's a closer look. Manufacturers of catsup, pickles, etc., also excuse me, a machine shop for manufacturing bean pickers. People in this, people familiar with Sanford maps probably recognize this pink structure as a brick structure. So the machine shop was a, a building of some, you know, value. And you can see by the markings here, this marking indicates windows. And the double marks indicates two stories of windows. So this was a two-story brick building, kind of a fairly substantial building. And over here, the yellow signifies a wood frame building in which were held 10 enormous pickling tubs to make all of the wonderful products that were put out by the Ypsilanti Condiment Company. The Ypsilanti Condiment Company was listed in the 1875 city directory as pickle manufacturers near a cross street bridge. It was owned at that time by the town miller and also um, a machinist, Charles Ferrier. But they were represented by Spencer Drake, who was ultimate, who turned out to be actually the fall guy 
when the condiment company got into trouble, which it did in 1895 and 6. By that time, a dairy and food commissioner, oops, typo, yikes, existed in Michigan and found that the catsup put out by the Ypsilanti Condiment Company was tainted with what was a common preservative of that era, salicylic acid, and fined. They did not improve or reform their food manufacturer because they were caught again a few, couple of years later for selling adulterated vinegar, and that event went to trial, People versus Spencer Drake, who was the representative for the Ipsy Condiment Company. He was found guilty and fined by $50 and costs. And that's when the Ypsilanti Condiment Company kind of vanishes from the directories and from the paper trail. And it seems to have gone out of business for good just before the 19th century. But that was our own Ypsilanti example of food adulteration and its consequences. Towards a purer food, Michigan was the fifth state in the continental United States to develop an agency to oversee and enforce pure food laws. Massachusetts was the first one in 1869, followed by California, Virginia, Minnesota, and Michigan. So one of the earlier states to create and start enforcing these pure food laws. One, of a, one major player in that effort was Robert Clark Kenzie, who was associated with Michigan State University, where he taught for many years. And he was an, his family immigrated from New York, came here very early in Michigan's history, before it was a state. He served during the Civil War as a, sur as a surgeon and was captured. He got his medical degree from University of Michigan in 1851, which was, I believe, the first class to receive, to, to, upon which were conferred medical degrees from the University of Michigan. And he worked as a professor of chemistry at MSU for many, many years and was very widely known and appears often in the Detroit Free Press because he often was the, the voice of authority for testing various food products. If something was said to have been found pure by Professor Kenzie, that was kind of a, the imprimatur of a legitimate food product. He was respected for his authority in testing foods. And he was instrumental in forming the first body of people who, the first food and dairy commissioners in Michigan that would oversee the food supply. He helped pass that act, creating that body, and he was appointed the first state analyst, so he was responsible for foods across the state. One thing he's famous for is his discovery that not only foods were being adulterated, but even wallpaper was being adulterated with the same colorant, the beautiful green arsenic. He was so startled by this startling information that he published a book about this, which actually is still held in U of M's holdings. I've seen it. I looked at it very gingerly. It's called Shadows from the Walls of Death, which is a collection of wallpaper samples, all of which are colored using arsenic, which was not only green, but arsenic could also produce blues, yellows, and reds, and other different colors, depending on how you, um, how you used it. He was famous for that book. So it's um, similar to his work in food. He's also known not only for, for his food as state anal not only for his work as state analyst and for his groundbreaking, groundbreaking wallpaper book. He is remembered or was known at that time as the father of Michigan sugar beet industry. He was an early campaigner for the value of the sugar beet, which some people thought was a useless sort of way of making sugar. And he popularized its growth, its, um, it popularized that its uh, planting across the state and tried to popularize the product as well as a Michigan product. Sometime later, as you know, in 1906, the federal government started passing pure food laws and you started seeing cartoons 
like this one, which was in Puck magazine, which shows the whole panoply of foods that not only Michigan, but the whole nation had been contending with. Tan bark coffee, we mentioned that earlier. Coffee tainted with tan bark, used in a, in a, in a leather tannery, which does not sound all that wholesome. Adulterated whiskey, nearly cured ham. Also shoddy cloth, secondhand ham. It sounds like a, kind of a hipster band name, maybe. <laughs> Paraffin, sand, sugar, everything here. People were, as you can see, just sick of adulterated foods. Even this shark is, is repulsed by the potted ham that it has eaten. So even the sharks are disgusted by these awful products. You can see this, is, this whole conceit in this cartoon is the Boston Tea Party. People are depicted as dressed in, what, uh, in Native American clothing, as people were in the, in the Tea Party, and the good ship dope, dope meaning uh, a tainted food in general, and people are just eschewing and just hurling away all of these disgusting products. The pure food laws, of course, did not immediately wipe out adulterated foods in the nation, but it went far to at least start bringing accountability to people who have been for too many years and throughout the 19th century foisting all these really disgusting, you know, glue jelly, wood alcohol tonic, gypsum flour, full lard cheese on the public. So that is just an overview of our own part in Michigan in this national voyage towards pure food laws. This program was recorded on April 14, 2019 at the Ann Arbor District Library.